So welcome everyone to today's virtual digital economy seminar. We are very much looking forward to the special session on merger policy in digital markets with an amazing group of speakers today. But let me briefly mention the formalities for the talk as usual. Um, we are especially grateful to have Tommaso Dusso at DAW Berlin as our moderator today. Um, if you have any questions throughout the session, send these to us in the chat window. Tommaso will then unmute you so you can address the panelists directly. Also, we will be recording this session and make it available on YouTube afterwards. So if you do ask a question yourself, you will also appear in that recording. All right, without further ado, um, I'm excited to hand over to Tommaso. Yeah, thank you very much, Hannes. It's, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here to today with uh, um, this uh, very nice group of people. Um, so there, there have been mounting concerns about uh, the rise of concentration, margins, market power over the past mm -hmm. years, and uh, these concerns uh, are spread across sectors, uh, but are particularly strong uh, in digital markets, that is uh, markets dominated by multi-sided digital platforms. And this is because uh, these markets have, uh, already have a natural tendency to, to this concentrated uh, structure, mostly to, due to uh, very uh, strong network effects. And, and surely mergers, and in particular acquisitions, uh, might have been very important uh, to exacerbate such tendencies. Uh, we know that uh, the five tech giant, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, um, they have been uh, acquiring hundreds of companies uh, over the past decades. And these targets uh, tend to be small, uh, very young startups um, that very often provides uh, some kind of complementary, uh, com complementary function, uh, functionalities or services uh, uh, to those of the acquiring uh, incumbent. Uh, so this, uh, the integration of these products uh, into a ecosystem that is uh, well functioning and established uh, uh, can be very, very efficient, but uh, there are also a lot of concerns that this acquisition can kill competition, be actual or potential, may uh, have negative uh, influence on uh, the innovation in the market, we have terms like killer acquisition, kill zone, and since two days, uh, um, reverse uh, killer acquisition, not um, And um, so today we want to discuss exactly this, uh, um, this kind of issues. And we are really, really lucky to have uh, three fantastic uh, panelists to discuss uh, um, these uh, issues. And all of them have been extremely prominent uh, in the uh, current debate. So the first speaker will be Fiona Scott Morton. She is professor of economics at uh, the Yale University um, School of Management. She has uh, published a lot in empirical I.O., uh, but on top of that, she has also been very much involved in policy. She served. Uh, the antitrust division of the Department of Justice in the US. And uh, very relevant for the debate today, last year she shared the sub We seem to have lost Tommaso. Yeah, he froze. On the possible responses to issues of increased concentration and market power of digital platforms, so exactly the topic of uh, today. Uh, the second speaker will be uh, Luis Cabral, who is Professor of Economics and International Business and Chair of the Department of Economics uh, at uh, the Leonard Stern School of Business as, uh, at NYU. Um, he is a extremely well-known researcher uh, studying innovation platforms and reputation. Um, and it also has been a strong and maybe sometimes more uh, cautionary voice uh, in the debate uh, about uh, the role that mergers and merger policy might have, especially on innovation uh, in uh, digital industries. So also extremely well fitting uh, to the discussion today. And uh, the third uh, panelist is uh, Tommaso Valletti uh, with QM we uh, discussed uh, one minute ago. Uh, he is professor of economics at Imperial, Imperial College Business School. 
Uh, his work also a lot on topics related to regulation and competition in telecom, but also digital markets. And he also has a very strong record in policy. He is a uh, non-executive executive director to the board of the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. And he was uh, the chief economist at DigiCom um, in the past years. Uh, and especially during that time, uh, he was extremely actively involved in all kinds of discussion uh, on competition in the tech sphere. And um, as anybody who knows Tommaso, he really does not hide his views. Uh, there are sometimes uh, uh, provocative, um, and I really hope that uh, he will do it today as well, right? So to have a very lively discussion. So uh, the structure is that each panelist uh, will make an opening statement of uh, 10 minutes. Uh, afterwards, I will open the discussion. I have some questions for sure, but I would be very, very happy uh, to have a very lively debate with many questions for you from the public. So. We have this chat function, use it, uh, state your question, and we will try to do our best to pass on these questions to uh, our great uh, panelists. So let's start. Fiona, um, you are in. Uh, thank you, Tommaso, for that uh, very nice introduction and the um, invitation to speak to everybody today. Uh, my charge given by Tommaso is to outline the main competitive issues in the mergers of digital platforms. I'm going to have three points to make there and then uh, conclude with some policy implications. So the first point is that market definition is harder in this context. Uh, these are typically new products and services. That means there's no legal precedent. It means that the lawyers at the agencies maybe have never used this product. The judge has never used this product. Maybe only teenagers use this product. Um, everything is trending, so the evidence from three years ago might be quite different, and the evidence from two years hence might be quite different. Uh, technological changes are subtle and sometimes require expertise. Almost always they require understanding of some jargon and some technical uh, uh, facts. And then probably most importantly, um, complements can later disintermediate a platform or a bigger company and become a substitute at a future time. So for example, Netscape the browser was not in the operating system market, but it was a future substitute or arrival of Microsoft Windows. So this problem of the, the acquisition occurring of a complement does not mean that you're uh, avoiding the problem of a decline in competition in the future when that complement becomes a substitute. The second thing is that the level of uncertainty in these mergers is much higher. This is not like airlines or beer, where we know that next year we're all going to still drink beer. Okay? Economists uh, can cope with uncertainty. We use expected value, uh, which nicely weighs the gains from additional competition along with the likelihood of the additional competition. But the law often cannot uh, cope with uncertainty very well. The law often focuses only on the likelihood, uh, which of course is not going to maximize consumer surplus. The, this increased uncertainty really heightens the role of the burden of proof and defaults. So think about it this way. If the government has to prove that some harm will occur in the future and there's uncertainty, well, that's going to be really hard. If you change the burden of proof, reversed it, and said the firms have to prove that on, in no state of the world in the future would they ever be competing with each other, that's likewise really hard because the the trends in technology and the changes in those business models are going to uh, move and it's going to be hard to predict them in the future. So how the law sets the burden of proof in a jurisdiction is going to really matter to the kinds of cases that can be brought and whether uh, the agency can protect consumers or not. Likewise, harms are going to be very important both to getting the right answer, what is going to happen to consumer welfare, and understanding how wrong the answer will be if you leave out the magnitude of those harms. Um, what, uh, what moves around harms? The harms depend on the ex ante competition and market structure. So for example, if there's a durable entrenched monopolist and there's a question about a small chance of some competition being applied to that durable entrenched large monopolist, that might be many, many uh, dollars or euros of consumer benefit. 
If on the other hand, there are four competitors in the market and there's a small entrant with some probability of increased competition, there might be a less uh, benefit in terms of the number of euros uh, because you already had some competition to begin with. So uh, the ex ante state is going to matter a lot to the quantification of the harms. Lastly is the very frequent presence in digital business of network effects, strong network effects. When you have strong network effects, you tend to have concentrated market structure. Everybody wants to be on the same social media platform because that's where their friends are. And you tend not to see 50-50 market shares or 33-33-33. Instead, you see tipping. One firm gets the majority of the market. So in those situations, a small entrant with traction can be absolutely critical. It might be the only source of competition. Uh, the incumbent is typically going to be able to see that traction better than the agency and possibly move first to purchase that uh, entrant before the traction turns into actual tipping of the market. So with those three things in mind, what are the implications for a policy? Um, the first implication for policy is you just have to accept the uncertainty. It's there, it's part of the world and you have to embrace it, do the best possible uh, and don't fall back to everything's uncertain, therefore we won't enforce. That of course is choosing a side, that's not maximizing consumer welfare. And uh, there's just no way around the fact that there's uncertainty. Um, another thing to do with that uncertainty is to, is to fix the law, change laws or change uh, regulations to calibrate to this level of uncertainty and make sure that it's being used in a balanced way um, to, to try to um, catch the harmful mergers and let through the harmless ones. Then I would say we want to protect mavericks and small entrants in this environment because of the network effects and the, because of the outsized role that those small entrants have in creating competition for large incumbents. And then uh, lastly, I would say um, we're not, of course, usually worried about um, huge platforms merging with huge platforms. It's the big platform and the startup. Um, now, I will say we also worry about niche a niche that's concentrating and uh, has two horizontal competitors merging like Bazaar Voice and Power Reviews or possibly Uber Eats and Grubhub. But the main, um, I think, setting we're worried about is the big platform and the little, and the little uh, acquisition. And we need to think through these harms carefully um, in terms of, of false positives and false negatives. If the agency blocks a harmless merger, then what's the cost of that? Well, the platform has to build that functionality itself. If the agency blocks a harmful merger, then the incumbent is going to, sorry, if the agency allows the mistake, if the agency allows a harmful merger, the incumbent is gonna keep their market power and that could be an entrenched uh, bad thing and cause large amounts of harm. Now, the other thing to keep in mind with harms is the impact on innovation. So when the agency blocks a harmless merger, it's true that the platform just builds the functionality itself, but the small startup was not able to sell out. So we need to think about what that does to the incentives to innovate. If we're being tougher on both mergers and antitrust, I think you have a few different effects. First, if the startup has entered head to head with the platform, just in order to be bought out, that's not innovation that we really need as an economy. If the purpose of that is to be bought out, then there's no gain. If the purpose is to compete head to head and gain market share, then the tightening of antitrust enforcement will protect that small entrant from being squashed by the platform as well as being bought. And so if it's protected from being squashed, it has a higher chance of gaining share and winning vis-a-vis -vis the platform. So there we would see an increase in the incentives to innovate because there's less chance of being squashed. If the startup enters as a complement and wants to be bought, then there's two scenarios. Is that a complement that would morph into a substitute later? And that would be a harm, so that should be blocked. Or is it a complement that's never gonna become a substitute and therefore it's harmless and it should be allowed? So, um, the mistakes that we're worried about are the ones where um, the, the entrant is going to be a 
morph into a substitute later and that would be a dangerous uh, thing and we want the agencies to be able to block those. So that's the kind we, and if we get these, uh, if we make mistakes in this area, what is that gonna do? There'll be some harms to incentives to innovate and incentives to build, but mostly I think what that would do is cause startups to be focused on the fact that they want to be a complement that is not going to uh, disintermediate if they plan to sell in a merger. If they plan to take on the platform, then that's great too. And increased antitrust enforcement uh, would be necessary to protect them so that they don't again get bought or squashed uh, and can provide a long run uh, competition to that platform. So those uh, are just a quick overview of some of the issues and I'll stop there and pass it on to my colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. This was uh, perfect, below 10 minutes. Uh, so, Luis, uh, your turn. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak here at the panel. Um, I'm gonna be a little bit of a contrarian view, and so perhaps I should start by stating what is it that I am in agreement with the so-called common wisdom regarding uh, merger policy. Uh, first, I'm very concerned with the extent of market power and abuse of dominant position amongst uh, GAFA or GAFM or whatever classification you wanna use. Uh, I think it's quite clear. Second, I do believe that US merger policy, merger policy generally speaking, but US merger policy in particular has largely been characterized by under enforcement. I think that, um, you know, the healthcare sector, hospitals in particular, airlines, beer, I mean, there are so many examples and both Fiona and Tomasa could certainly enlarge that list for me right now. And I, I'm very much in agreement with that. And thirdly, I also agree that many of these acquisitions, especially when you have a large firm acquiring a small firm, have the nature of uh, preemption. They are preemptive acquisitions. So I think those are three uh, major points that I think I'm in agreement with and, and that I think are important. Uh, the only thing that I would say regarding the third one is that those preemptive acquisitions, uh, at least the evidence we have of those is primarily from sectors like pharma or biotech. So that's kind of one first uh, set of points that I, I thought it would be interesting to, to put forward as, as a preface. Um, now, proposed merger reform, which is what we're talking about in here. Uh, there are many things that we've been talking about. I think there are largely two types of ideas that I think are on the table that I think is worthwhile discussing. First, it's the idea with which I largely agree that we need to change the criteria so as to include otherwise excluded mergers from review. <clears throat> and this has to do with market definition. Uh, for example, the work that Tommaso and Andrea have been doing on, you know, in advertising, we have to look for the market for eyeballs. That's really what matters. Uh, and that's very, there's not a lot of relation between that and, and the market size or the value of the firms in question. So we need to be a little more flexible in trying to uh, define markets. Uh, and second, thresholds, again, think about uh, Tom Ullman's uh, stealth consolidation, where we, we need to do some work on that. Um, so that part, I actually think I'm very much in agreement that's an area where merger policy ought to evolve. And then there's the second idea, and that's the one that I think is more contentious. Uh, and Fiona already mentioned that, uh, the idea of radically changing <clears throat> uh, the way we <clears throat> deal with mergers in the, in the high tech space, in particular when a large firm acquires a small firm, in particular the way we assign the burden of proof of pro-competitive effects. That's in the uh, so-called Stigler report that Fiona uh, coordinated in the Furman report and in several other papers. I think that there's a certain uh, I wouldn't say unanimity, but at least a certain consensus around the idea of uh, shifting the burden of proof in mergers. And this is the part, this is the part that, that I largely disagree with for the reasons that I will try to present next. Um, and the first point, which uh, Fiona has already kind of outlined for me a little bit, is that the digital space is different in several ways. It's very difficult to predict business models and how they will evolve. I mean, just look at the histories of Google and Facebook and Microsoft, you know, what kind of ideas they had, you know, uh, they had no idea of what they were going to be in 2020. Second, it's very difficult to protect and transact IP. That's because copyright and patents are not good instruments, certainly not nearly as good as they are in pharma, for example, 
in terms of protecting IP. Third, acquisitions play an important role in transferring technology. This is very related to the previous point. Sometimes it's the best way of uh, getting a certain technology uh, and, and the people who know about it is to just buy the entire, the entire startup. Otherwise I'll just buy the patent or license the patent. Fourth, frequently there are important synergies, complementarities, whatever you wanna call it, in the sense that the value of a certain technology is much, much greater in the hands of, a, of the buyer than, than of the firm independently. And we've, we've seen quite a number of examples of that. And fifth, and this is the main point that uh, I want to bring to the table, which Fiona has already mentioned as well, the prospect acquisition does serve as an important incentive for innovation by a startup. So this brings me to where I disagree with, with the common wisdom. Um, my point is that reverting the burden of proof in mergers in the digital space is probably a bad idea. Um, and one thing that Fiona mentioned, I think is very important, is that we live in a world of uncertainty, not asymmetric information, mind you, uncertainty. It's not like the acquirer knows a lot more than the emerger authority. It's that there's so much uncertainty as, as to whether this is going to be a substitute, a complement, or none of the above. It's just a spurious kind of acquisition. Many, I'd say most of these acquisitions are done for the option value that they have. There's a lot of uncertainty. It's true that part of the option value may be preemption, I agree. It's one of the options. Now it's a, in a matter of discussion. And is it 90% of the option? Is it 50% of the option? Is it 10% of the option? That's open to debate. I think that reverting the burden of proof would considerably lower the rate of acquisitions. And I think this is a positive statement that Fiona Prada would agree with me. Uh, and next, I think that lowering that rate of acquisitions would uh, considerably dampen uh, innovation incentives. So that's largely kind of my point. And I think from what I've heard talking to a, a variety of people, including Fiona herself, one main objection to this point is, um, I don't know if this is your expression, Fiona, the scrambled eggs syndrome. Uh, or, Common. Sorry? Everybody, everybody uses it, it's not me. Everybody uses it. So I think it's a valid analogy. In digital markets, it's very difficult to have exposed divestiture. It's difficult, if not impossible, really because it's very difficult to make people unlearn what they learn. It's not like I have a physical asset. I just got data, I got knowledge, and now it's very hard for, for us to separate that from, from the firm. So as valid as it is, I also would add that you know, this is by no means the only or the main exposed remedy we have. And in fact, if you start looking at what are the things that worry me about the large firms, I'm worried about Apple, uh, benefiting Apple, Apple Music uh, and, 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 um, and harming Spotify. I'm worried about Google promoting its own services in search engines. I'm worried about Amazon favoring its own products in its uh, uh, recommender system. I mean, I could go on with a list of problems that worry me from a competition policy point of view. And I think that the more natural remedies for problems like that are going to be ex post behavior or other form of regulation rather than ex ante mergers. So I do agree with the criticism that uh, exposed divestiture is very difficult, but I personally do not think that outweighs my point about the, uh, the uh, uh, negative effect of reverting the, uh, the burden of proof in mergers. In other words, th there's gonna be an optimal balance between exempt remedies and exposed remedies. And I think that in this case, we clearly should go in the direction of exposed. Uh, I don't, I, I think it's a huge problem, market power in high tech. I just think that we should primarily work on, on uh, uh, exposed regulation of behavior. Uh, by the way, there are also many other issues that people talk about like privacy, value of information and so forth, which have very little to do with, with uh, what we're talking about in here, but that's a different story. So bottom line, I think we're going in the wrong way. We're barking at the wrong tree to use the, sort of the American expression. Um, I think there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of uh, uh, behavior regulation. Uh, I think I can much more easily live with a few false negatives than with an abundance of false positives in, in, merger, in merger policy. So that's it for me in terms of a general introduction to Masa. Much. You also stayed below your 10 minutes. It's great. Uh, so, uh, Tommaso. Let's see. Thank you. Doing. Thank you, Tommaso. And hi to all the panelists. Good afternoon or rather good morning to Luis in New York or good evening if, if any morning 
is in is in Asia. So um, it's great to see so many familiar faces among the panelists and also attendees. I see many familiar names. So I hope you're all well. So I want to make a, a few. I want to start from a very pragmatic point so that people understand the nature of the problem. We are talking about merger policy in digital, and this is policy. So policy means that people have to make decisions in finite time. So we don't have uh, the, the, the time that we usually use in academia to complete a study. So the numbers may be helpful. So a number just, so you, you have an order of magnitude. I'm talking about Europe, because this is a situation I know better. And maybe Fiona can confirm if these numbers are, rich, if these numbers are, are so different in the US. So in Europe, every year there are about 15,000 mergers which are uh, completed, 15,000. So these are the, the, the M&A equipment. This often is it's minnows, we don't care, 15,000. Some of those may be um, uh, considered by the national authorities and only the very, very big ones go in front of the European Commission. And again, just to give you an order of magnitude, every year there is at most 400 mergers in general, in general, that are in front of the of Digicom. 400, the universe is 15,000. 400, the really big ones, because these are those we may worry about. Of those 400, typically three quarters, 80% go through something which is called a simplified procedure. Simplified procedure really is about a box ticking exercise. There is no economist involved, or at least no one from the chief economist team would ever look into those deals. So we are really shrinking, 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 shrinking further and further. If I consider the intervention rate of Digicomp overall, but this is the intervention rate over the 400 at most the Digicomp would be assessing in a year, the intervention rate is 6% historically. Okay? Six, seven, five, six, seven, it oscillates in that, in, in that range, six, seven percent. And by intervention rate, I mean of the 400 mergers at most, how many of those mergers even went into a phase two? Phase two means looking a bit deeper into the merger. How many mergers had a remedy or how many mergers were prohibited? Okay, so adding those uh, categories together, you got the intervention rate. Prohibitions are very rare event. They exist as an order of magnitude that the magic number is two. So there are two prohibitions every year. Last year, there were three. There was a, a, a big change. We all heard about Almstom Siemens because that's only the only thing you hear about because most of the thing goes through. So this is the current merger enforcement in general in Europe. And I don't think the numbers are very different than the US. If anything, Europe is perceived as a tougher enforcer than the US. Now we come to digital. Digital, and these are figures from the latest interesting work from uh, uh, Luis. We consider the, the last 19 years from 2000, which has collected some data and only focusing on GAFA, so Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft, they bought more than 800 firms, okay? So the order of magnitude is 800 plus. And if I'm not uh, wrong, this, the rate of acquisition has increased in the second part of a sample compared to the first, okay? 800. Of those 800, again, an order of magnitude, you have to think that about 97% or 98 have not been vetted by any authority globally. I'm not talking about a Digicomp or, or the DOJ globally, national authorities. So most of those mergers were not even notified, okay? They went under the radar because the rules allowed it to go under the radar. And the very few, we are talking about a few dozens that were actually vetted, they were all allowed. So the number that I would like people to remember out of all this, Okay, are we crazy? Are we over under enforcement? It's a zero. We are under a zero prohibition in the past 20 years, in the past two decades, in among the companies which has the highest market capitalization in the world. I'm sure, I'm sure these are great firms, that's why they're big, but these are also most likely the firms we, we should be looking into because that's where market power is more likely to be also. So this is the current system, and I struggle to see a little bit the debate, the cautiousness of, yes, small, tab, small steps, because we have not enforced at all in the digital, zero enforcement. So I, I'm not there to say that all mergers are bad. I'm not, say, I'm, I'm not there to overgeneralize to every digital platform. 
I do see a big problem with a few big digital platforms which have a lot of market power, which have a history of uh, abuses in the, in the markets, and that's Google, which has a history of, having, of doing something very dodgy with our data, our privacy, and that's Facebook. I do have a problem, and I'm, and I'm very happy to name and shame because I think that's where the problem lies. So this is where we are. Why did, uh, did, did, did we get here? We got here for a variety of factors. Uh, we have the wrong thresholds, enforcers have not the right competence. Enforcers by and large are run by lawyers and, and a few economists and that's about it. They don't have engineers, they don't have computer scientists. They think it's also complicated. They buy into the narrative that it's also complicated and, and, and hence we shouldn't be looking into it. Precedents matter a lot from a legal point of view, but then we always are in a catch-22 situation. We never look into any murder. We'll never have a precedent. We will never look into another murder in the, into the future. So the situation is not very rosy at all. I think also we are there because of um, a political reason. The problem is not starting now. And I, I would not have had any problems 20 years ago when these companies were, were we're actually emerging on the country. We were very excited 20 years ago. I would have started having problem 10 years ago when market power was consolidating and, uh, and that was not under the Trump administration, that was Obama. And, uh, and uh, these companies became very, very good at uh, advocacy, at lobbying and, uh, and, uh, and uh, campaign a politics, which is, by the way, something which I'm studying right now because I, I think it, it's, a, it's a big problem. We are also there in part, so these enforcers are timid, they're not sure of themselves, uh, I'm not expecting much to happen. The researchers also, research, empirical research has stalled. We haven't made progresses in when it comes, and I want to be specific uh, because people are very territorial and, and, they, and they feel very personal um, insults. We haven't made much progress into understanding the behave, the competitive behavior of these companies I'm talking about. Right? There is great work, great theory work, but when you are running a case, the way the consultants, the economists are coming to you, they still tell you a story you could have heard 20 years ago. They're still gonna tell you, well, market definition, but well, we don't know. Uh, consumers can download stuff, they can find an alternative search engine, they can easily move, they are rational, and that's where the story ends, okay? Evidence presented very little because the burden is on the side of the regulator to show, to, to show what the definition of the market is and there is an anti-competitive effect coming from it. So uh, researchers, unfortunately, haven't helped, not because the researchers are bad, because we haven't had any access to data from these companies whatsoever. Okay? And this is quite peculiar. Companies are obviously reluctant to, to let researchers look into their, their, their data, but this is quite unique. If you want to do research involving big companies, airlines would mention, pharmaceutical, well, you can. You do find data available. You can. When, when, it, when it comes to Google, Facebook, Amazon, nothing, nothing. And the paradox is that these companies are actually sitting, and again, research on the, comp the way these companies compete. Okay? Not a lot of stuff. On Facebook, you have data about social networks and everything. And that's not what we're talking about. So, and the paradox is that these companies are sitting on the largest trove of data ever, and uh, and this has not been uh, we haven't made much progress, put it that way. And um, and instead, when I could, because I was in a privileged position, could see some data, this narrative that anything can happen, uh, anything can still, you know, the trade-offs uh, that any economist, any good economist, can uh, tell you, gener generically about. When I looked into, into some data in the, I don't know, antitrust Google cases I was involved in, I saw a different reality when it comes to actual consumer behavior. I was really struck by the inertia, by the behavioral inertia of uh, um, uh, consumers. Consumers don't scroll through the search pages. 99% of the searchers stop at the first thing that Google shows and then the debate, but because that's the best, but 99%, that's a, a large number. Consumers do not, uh, uh, change the um, pre-installation on their um, devices. Sure, it's a possibility, but this is where the audience listening to this might do it, but you are the 1%, you are not the 99%. You really have to look at the behavior of the average person in a, in a market, and we are not representative of the average person in the market. People having anecdotes about my daughter, TikTok, etc. cetera. Let's, let's be more serious. Let's look at those data, and they, they're, they're going to tell you a different story.
what can we do? Some of the things I'm not going to repeat, um, both Luis and, uh, and Fiona mentioned, we can do more exposed studies, they're going to be valuable, they don't do too many, we can have new ways of, uh, of looking at these markets, attention brokers is something which I suggested, and uh, we can uh, think, I don't think this is really going to change much, to be honest, if I have to, to tell you what I really believe in, in uh, practice. So what should happen, in my view, is a combination of two things. First, Contrary to what Luis said, I do believe there should be, or maybe that's it's not contrary, but I do think there should be much more exante regulation. These are industries with externalities. Competition doesn't work well with externalities, we know. We want externalities to remain because they create value, but we don't want externality to accrue to a single player because it generates such an asymmetric playing field. We dealt with these problems of, of companies with large market power, such as telecoms, and we found solution, interconnection. You can port your numbers of your friends and contact numbers when you change operator. We dealt with that. And then we made sure that competition could still arise. So, and that was a um, good principle, which did involve some intervention. And I think we should get there. And, um, and that's, that's one solution. The other solution is to have, uh, um, the, the, instead, I'm very favorable when it comes to mergers to have uh, a rebuttable structural presumption in this game where it is the competition authority who has to show harm and then eventually efficiencies come back, but all the attention, all the focus of, of, the, of, of the, these giants, which have incredible resources, is on the first phase, no? just the market definition is completely wrong. It's much larger than it is. We don't have any market power. And so you never get to know really what, what they think they're gonna do with uh, the acquisition that they're, they're gonna buy. So. Just as a thought experiment, a rebuttable structural presumption means for very dominant platforms, so I'm not overgeneralizing, I'm taking into account the Google, the Facebook, the Amazon, and maybe Apple, that's about it, okay? For very dominant platforms, you cannot purchase anyone. Okay? It's, so an entrant can be bought by someone else, by the way. It's not a prohibition on an entrant being acquired. It's a prohibition on being acquired by an incumbent unless, and this is the rebuttable part, you can show me that there are real efficiencies that will be good for consumers. Now think of this new game. Think of these companies obviously will react because the resources they have is enormous. So they will start hiring consultants and they will start hiring economists in order to run empirical work, which is defensible, which is showing that some cogent effects coming from the merger, they really need the merger and the game would change completely. And instead of having an absurd discussion about the sex of the angels and whether, uh, you know, Shapiro in, in a variant information rules of 20 years ago is still the, the, the way to go 20 years later, we would, show, we, we would be shown what they really think about their actual business models as of 2020. Thank you. Um, can I jump in for a second, Tommaso? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to tie together what Luis and uh, Tommaso said uh, in terms of the burden of proof. So notice that Tommaso said there have been zero uh, challenged mergers. And Luis is against switching the burden of proof because he thinks there would then be zero consummated mergers. Okay, I think these are absolutely correct as, uh, as kind of descriptions of what we've got and then a reason why uh, Luis doesn't wanna switch the burden of proof. Let me just say that if you're gonna go as far as switching the burden of proof, that's gonna require some kind of law. And if you're gonna change the law, you can change the standard. You don't have to have a standard where it's zero one, like where, where it's a hundred percent, you know, the, the standard is so high. So let me back up. We have zero challenges to these digital mergers. Why is that? Because it's really hard to prove. That ties in with what we all agree has been under enforcement in merger, uh, in merger control generally. The plaintiff faces a really uphill battle in antitrust in the United States, for sure. So given that world, uh, it makes total sense that defendants say, don't switch the burden of proof on me because they understand perfectly well that then the uphill battle would be on their side. 
So what I think would be much more healthy for consumers is if we could change, switch the burden of proof, because I think actually the information about efficiencies and technological trends and all of that stuff lies in the hands of the merging parties. I'd much rather have them explain it to the court than a government person explain it to the court. Um, but then how about we change the way we do this so that we again get some mergers being allowed and some mergers not being allowed instead of 100% one way or 100% the other way. It feels to me that that's what we're trying to do, allow through the good ones and block the bad ones. And we need a system that lets, gives us some ability to do that rather than this bang bang situation we're in. And then lastly, for the people watching who work for platforms, I'd like you to please be honest when you quote Luis Cabral's paper. Uh, if you're going to say that he's against switching the burden of proof, you should also say that he wants to regulate platforms, because that's a very important alternative but for world. It's not, as I hear it, that Luis says uh, all mergers should be allowed and we'll just let platforms um, you know, do whatever they want. Uh, so that this is, a, in the United States, one issue with Luis's position is that we're not regulating anything. Uh, and as a result, uh, the only tool we have is antitrust, and so therefore we can't really adopt his program. And then lastly, Tommaso, that's part of the reason why there's data on beer, uh, sorry, on airlines and on drugs is that we have a regulator. We have no regulator for digital in the United States, and therefore we have no mechanism to produce data. Researchers who work on airlines typically use the Department of Transportation. Researchers who work on pharma typically use a lot of material from the FDA. It is very interesting here, and again, because I understand there is a, co a community of researchers in front of us, my main concerns, um, as you probably know, are with two platforms, which are two platforms whose business model is um, advertising, the advertising funded platform, so Google and Facebook. The market now with COVID-19, we don't know what's going to happen, but uh, you, again, orders of magnitude matter. The revenues in, in 2020 in uh, advertising is going to be about $250 uh, billion in a year for uh, two-thirds going to Google and one-third going to Facebook. Okay? So it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot by any standard. What's surprising, and I look into this a lot, is that we don't know who pays for that money. Okay, We don't know. Nobody can, can know. It's the most opaque, the most obscure industry and there, is, um, there are allegations, there was um, a report by PwC recently saying that um, some money disappears. Okay? So and this, this is interesting to me. It, it has to be interesting for anyone, at least knowing who pays for that. There was a, a question from uh, our friend Yossi in the, in the chat that said, what's the harm to consumers? Y y Yossi, the, the, the harm in any merger is that the, the counterfactual is what would, be, what would be the world if the merger had not consummated. And so I can give you lots of examples. For instance, there could be Facebook, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram. There would be another social network that would be a better social network. There would be another search engine that would be a better search engine. What's interesting historically, and this is just a case study because we don't have enough data, but a case study that was done uh, by a legal scholar, okay, and legal scholars tend to write very, very long papers with, with a lot of footnotes. But in the footnotes, there is a lot of interesting stuff. Okay? They know a lot about the industries. Okay? They don't run regressions fine, but they tell us a coherent story sometimes. So the, the, and what's interesting is that Facebook was not incumbent for a long time. They were actually a challenger. Okay? In the early days, there was competition between Facebook and MySpace, which was incumbent back then. And there was competition. And there was competition, and then comp competition was on quality, okay? So what's interesting is that, is, is that Facebook was the first platform to allow users to decide on the level of privacy they wanted. So users group, okay? Because that's the way they differentiated themselves. And competition was crashed, okay? And we got into another world, which is monopolized, and then those features that Facebook had introduced early on disappeared. So Facebook had the market power to dictate its own. And then when this disappeared, so privacy was lowered, so question uh, of Yossi, what can be worse? Well, you may, maybe you, you don't pay directly, but you don't see through the consequences. When you accept the privacy terms, honestly, guys, what does it mean that you allow the company to use the data according to something? So there is no way that the question is even something we can understand the implication. Um, the paper I did with Andrea, I have a channel where because of concentration in digital markets, 
attention becomes more monopolized. And th those advertisers who have to go through the bottleneck of our at attention, it, it, it creates incumbency mechanism where there is in product markets, incumbents that can preempt entrance because they have just have to foreclose one channel if there is concentration or a few if there is a concentration market. So ultimately, we end up paying more for the things we see online because we can compare. I don't know if what you offer me as a local restaurant or, or an Airbnb, is that really the cheapest room? The, the business model of, of Google and Facebook is to get a share. So you're, you're shown something. And, if, and, and if, if you cannot compare because you don't have access to other platforms, uh, at least this is our, it's a theoretical argument, of course, because we don't have the data. So, so let me add one more innovation. Uh, Tommaso said innovation and he said add uh, prices going through to final goods prices. And sorry, Tommaso, I just want to say there's also quality adjusted price, yeah. right? If you think about uh, the fact that the consumer pays zero monetary price, there's the quality of the platform, which could be higher if there were competition. Sorry. Right. No, it's good. Uh, so some of the questions so that are popping up. So some were related to non-monetary terms. Uh, so the first one. But Luis uh, wanted to have uh, the word. Right. Yes, thank you. Uh, I mean, just uh, I actually think that we agree more than we disagree on most of these issues. And, and just to clarify details now, um, the issue of burden of proof, I agree with Fiona, this is not a zero hundred kind of thing. It's more about how to fine tune uh, that merger policy. And there are two things that Tommaso and Fiona brought up. One is the issue of bad information. I agree that uh, major authorities do not have computer scientists in them, and Google has. So they actually have more expertise. So that point, I think it's a good point to say that why not have them do the uh, analysis because they have the expertise. I would say because there's a lot of bias, because there's a lot of, uh, I mean, it, it's a, uh, it's so easy for me if I want to prove a, a, a pro-competitive effect. And so it's not clear that the quality of that information would be very high. Uh, although I understand your point that uh, they may have a, a more qualified personnel. And also in this sector, unlike other industries, uncertainty is much more important than asymmetric information. Again, I cannot possibly emphasize this point enough. Uh, it's not like they know and, and, and the OJ does not know. I mean, nobody really knows. So that's one thing. The second thing to address what Tommaso said, uh, they have a lot more resources. That's totally true. But I just don't see how that can be an argument for reversing the burden of, of proof. If you want to do that, then why don't you create the tax? If you want to buy a company, you have to pay the DOJ uh, $100 million for them to uh, conduct a review. Problem solved. It cannot be an issue of resources. I just don't see uh, that as being an argument for reversing the burden of proof. Uh, the other thing I want to remark regarding Tommaso, that I, I agree that I think there's some initial terminology. Uh, the difference between exempt regulation and exempt remedies, the, I, this is just a, an issue. When I was talking about uh, exempt and exposed remedies, I was talking about merger review versus fixing a problem when it exists, uh, not about exempt regulation. Sorry for the confusion. I totally agree with you that I think these industries are way under-regulated. And we've dealt with similar issues in the past and regulation actually did a pretty decent job at, at doing it. And that's one of the reasons why we're putting so much weight on merger review is that it's right now, it seems like it's the only thing that we have. Uh, I understand that, but why it doesn't have to be the only thing. That's all I, I, I was trying to say. Yeah, uh, so, so this is a, is, is a good point. And, and indeed, I mean, it seems you, you are agreeing uh, more than disagreeing. So I think everybody agrees that um, there might be some reform or there, we need some reform of merger policy, right? Uh, you didn't, I mean, uh, you, you hinted at some possible reform uh, with, uh, which has to do with the uh, burden of proof or the rebuttable structural presumption. So that could be one thing. And uh, it seems that also you all agree that one might need ex ante regulation. So, um, but now imagine that we have, uh, um, we might have other um, uh, instruments, but still we have merger manager control, right? So one thing that you uh, stress a lot, uh, Luis, uh, but also Fiona, is this issue of uncertainty, right? So these are markets that are inherently much more uncertain than in the past. Uh, so how do we deal with it? So, um, so 
generally we, uh, in antitrust and competition policy, we tend to focus very much on actual competition, but now we tend to think more about potential competition. Um, this has maybe also a lot to do with innovation. So how do you see that? So uh, Fiona, you said, so legal scholars, the judges are not really able to cope with uncertainty. So, but how do we come out of this problem? So what does it mean we have to accept more uh, uncertainty? Um, so, well, I, I mean, I, I think you need some kind of sliding scale. That is to say, suppose that the entrant has a low probability of overthrowing the dominant platform. If the dominant platform is very dominant, entrenched, has a you know 99% market share and has been there for 10 years, that's a lot more valuable to consumers than the same entrant uh, potentially becoming successful in a market with four companies that are already competing with each other or with one dominant firm that's got a 75% market share and has had it for one year. Like, it, like exactly what kinds, of, how much harm you're going to create or for, you know, the benefit you're going to forego is really relevant as well as the probability that the entrant is going to create some kind of competition in the future. I think between, you know, getting a qualitative sense of both of those things is quite possible. So a couple of observations, um, and also I'm reacting um, to some of these things I read on the chat. So on the problem of innovation, so no, no one obviously has, you know, Christos ball, we cannot predict the future. This reminds me of the debate that we had maybe three years ago, two years ago, when there were this wave of mergers in the agrochemical industry, and we went strong with the innovation theory of harm in Dow DuPont by Monsanto, and we were attacked, you know, left, center, and right. And the point is that it's not that antitrust enforcers can predict who's going to be the winner, but you should try to understand the incentives, okay? So if in pharma, a uh, firm innovate because if they spend more, they increase the probability of, of getting an innovation. That's, that's all you need to know. In the, in the same fashion, I need to know what's the probability of getting a complementary product, a substitute product, if a complementary. So you need to have an idea about that. You're not going to be able to quantify perfectly, but you know, this is, this is you know, forensic evidence. You put some, some elements um, uh, uh, to, to get together and then you, you, you start discussing. You do some modeling, some empirical data. And so this is, this is uh, also the way to go. Some information that we don't use, and it's so interesting, for instance, uh, when there is an acquisition, financial analysts are used a lot. And then the information that you find in the financial analysts, they have legal responsibility to tell the shareholders why they're spending so much money. And they're going to tell you why they spend so much money. And if the price of the acquisition is so much offline, off the market, compared to the financial evaluation of, of analysis or the analyst, this is going to raise a lot of questions. And instead of, you know, leaving it, letting it go, this is where an, an investigation should, 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 happen, um, should actually happen. What's important, and it's a, it's a question that was, was, a, was, a, was a there, uh, it was in the, in the chat, is it what about killer acquisitions? There might have been quite a few, but what's important, I mean, the killer acquisition debate we had in Pharma is super interesting. The paper of uh, Colleen Callingham and co authors is great, and uh, hopefully, it will get published very soon. And so, and so, I wish the best. And that's the type of research I would like to see uh, among our colleagues. The, um, but this is a subset of the problems that, that, that we, we have. It's a very peculiar one. It's an important one, but very peculiar to pharma. In digital, it is bigger. Facebook, Google, they have the ability to innovate themselves. Okay? They don't have the incentives. If the alternative is on make or buy, if the alternative is that, okay, I sit and I eliminate a potential competitor in this complementary good where I could do it myself, I have an easier life. Instead, and this is the Dow DuPont debate, et cetera, et cetera, you should not eliminate that competitive, uh, competitive uh, pr pr pressure. It may not be great for the entrant, for the startup. It may not be great for the Facebook, but consumers overall will be better off. And that's a standard we currently have. Right, so there is a, a panel of this, uh, discussion in the chat. So uh, uh, I think, so uh, I don't know, we, we plan to let people 
ask the question themselves, but maybe given that it seems that uh, you all have the chat open and you can read the question, that maybe uh, we don't need the people uh, to, to talk about that. So I think that, uh, so... I mean, I, uh, I'm happy to summarize the last uh, five minutes of chat in uh, one point, if I may. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's a, I, what I actually think is a very interesting research issue. I, I wish uh, uh, Marco Taviana were here because uh, he's one of the experts on this matter. What is the relative, uh, what is the optimal balance between ex ante remedies and ex post remedies? He has this beautiful paper with uh, um, Emery Henry and uh, I forget the third co-author. I'm sorry, I forget the third co-author right now. On, on the optimal balance, uh, as it applies to uh, drug uh, regulation, should we, should we, uh, how should we use uh, ex, ex ante and ex post regulation? And I think something like that should be uh, written for merger versus regulation. Uh, and I think the result, I'm anticipating the result already, although I still think it's a good idea to write that paper, that whenever we have a situation of great uncertainty about the evolution of the business model, the relative value of a regulation becomes higher vis-a-vis a, -vis a traditional uh, merger review. And that's all I've been trying to say. The okay, problem so, with no, no, so, Tomaso, can I can I stop uh, you one moment because uh, the organizers and, and some of the uh, and the people say they don't see the questions of the others only we see the questions of the others so uh, so uh, maybe if you have just one sentence and then I would like really to to go to some of these questions uh, so you are the boss the you are the boss you decide you are the boss no, I could read out a question. Um, you can I, read, okay, so then okay. read all the questions. So, that's so I think what somebody asked about the role of these, these special nomenclatures, paramount cross-market significance, strategic market status in the Furman report, bottleneck power in the Stigler report. I think these are very interesting ways in which uh, those various reports think about regulating. So let's imagine that we are trying to, to get this middle ground between all mergers are blocked and all mergers are allowed. Perhaps what we do is we designate some platforms that we're worried about and we say those mergers are either not allowed or they have a special scrutiny through a regulator and that regulator will decide whether those mergers take place. And that would leave other mergers in the standard uh, situation, but these ones because of the nature of the buyer would get particular scrutiny. So that's one way in which you could try to get uh, this middle ground of not all mergers allowed and not all mergers blocked. Can you can you ask, because this was also a question I had uh, on uh, Tommaso point. Uh, so this would mean that you have to define a set of firms that are the potential bad guys, right? So do you think it's really feasible? Uh, so would you say that is the regulation, right? So the I, regulation I, is to, to If I make a keen on that, so think, Tomaso, that uh, in Europe, we have for the past 20 something years, a regulatory framework in telecommunications where with all its limitation, we define ex ante some markets. In the past, it was very minutious. It was, it would be the local loop on copper, et cetera. And then, over time, every three, four years, we would re revise the list of markets susceptible to ex ante regulation, and now this list has been re re reduced. And so, and, and that gave some, some uh, particular powers to regulators to enact some regulations. And uh, I don't see why we cannot follow that analogy. So we do, uh, we can define a market for search, a market for social networks, fine, or, or, or uh, hyper-targeted advertising. So this is where, you know, our brains, and there's lots of intelligent paper, uh, people out there, should be really focused on proposing solutions. Instead, we are so trained to find problems in everything which is new, the status quo is never going to change because of the power, because of the money, because of all this, because of the lawyers. And, uh, and, and instead, let's use our intelligence to do something new and, and then uh, in, in, in a more proactive way. And, and okay. just to follow up with Luis, just a very short thing. The reason that resources make a difference, Luis, is when you have the default that when the court is confused, we don't enforce. If that's the default, which is the default we have in the United States, then the parties pour money onto the case to create confusion. 
And if they can create confusion, then they win because the default is don't enforce. If you had a default that was enforce instead, then I think your point would be much more valid pouring money onto that. Um, you, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to create confusion anymore. Uh, and then it would be perhaps a different game. Yeah. Tomaso, one, a couple of things just to, um, to see if I misunderstood Luis or not. So on the point that he meant that actually there's not asymmetric information and regulators can predict the future as much as the firm or as little as the firm. I have to disagree. I mean, I would be worried if regulators can do the job of a Facebook. I mean, I believe in the, in the separation. Regulators are regulators, enforcement are regulators, and firms are business people. So I would assume they have a, a fantastic informational advantage, and that, that's why they become so, so, so in, in incredibly profitable. So I fundamentally disagree on that approach. And, um, and secondly, on you know, exposed behavioral things, uh, in principle, I would agree, but when I see the practice, how lengthy those antitrust proceedings are. So Google Shopping took seven years. The, the remedy hasn't been finalized even now, three years after the decision was uh, taken. And in industries with network effects, everything moving so fast, uh, we see exposed the bodies, and but that's about it. So I don't think we have the luxury of being so slow once again when it comes to this particular industry. So uh, I, I think so. Uh, uh, I think now everybody can see the chat, and I think so. Uh, you answer some of the questions. Uh, there are a couple of questions that we are not answer, uh, and uh, there was one question um, by Stefan Bechtold on uh, that is going a bit um, uh, to another topic, which is. Uh, uh, problems with privacy, uh, maybe the intersection between uh, competition policy, merger policy, and uh, data protection or consumer protection. So that uh, is maybe something we, we can come at some point. Um, and then uh, there is another question from Lisa George uh, uh, about merger and scale. And she says, uh, uh, that the comparative advantage of large tech firms is uh, to deploy new idea technology worldwide at global scale, uh, while uh, um, small startups don't have this ability. Um, so, which maybe goes in the direction uh, about so the complementarity, the ability of the, the big platforms to uh, essentially integrate this product in something that is more than what we generally think about when we think about market definition. So a platform is uh, an ecosystem, right? So, so when we think about merger antitrust cases, you define the market for search and then you have a lot of problems, but uh, you know, Google is active in so many different sub markets. So maybe um, um, you can, uh, so say something about these uh, two issues. Yeah, I mean, the first issue, I, I, I kind of, it's something that I believe would mostly agree that uh, uh, many, many of these acquisitions do uh, create complementarities between a new product slash technology and an existing platform, ecosystem, asset, whatever you want to call it, that uh, uh, creates value that, that would not be created otherwise. Uh, uh, that is, in a way, the, the root of, of, of the problem. Uh, if it weren't for that, uh, uh, it wouldn't be much of an issue in here, discussion. So I agree with that. And I also agree that, I mean, the, the difficulty is, is precisely to distinguish that from the purely preemptive uh, merger. I don't think there's any really purely preemptive merger. Most, most of them, given the level of uncertainty in this business, are probabilistic statements. This could become a threat, but it could become something nice for us to have. And, and um, I agree with Tomaso. Yes, they probably have uh, 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 more computer science and, and more data about the past. Uh, but I don't think with regards to the evolution of business models, I, yes, okay, I agree, probably a little better. I don't think it's gonna make a huge difference in terms of uh, predicting where the world will be in 10 years or, or, or five years. Well, um, and by the way, with respect to data, uh, in addition, I was serious about what I mentioned earlier. If, if, if it's an issue about dollar resources, make them pay. But also uh, give the DOJ, as they already have, I believe, 
uh, subpoena powers for all the data that you want. Uh, it's a sector that's not regulated, so the value of that subpoena is particularly high in this industry. Uh, I'm just not sure why uh, you cannot do that uh, and still have the DOJ uh, doing its work as it's done in the past. I, I agree with um, everything Luis said. I would augment that the point about asymmetric information is asymmetric information is possibly fixable with, by hiring experts, engaging in depositions, doing studies and so on. I think the uncertainty is not fixable. I think no matter how much each side tries, you've got the uncertainty and it can't be. I resolved. totally agree. I, I wanna I say totally something. Agree. I think that's a hugely important point. And I think that's one that's not going to be solved by reversing the burden of proof, in my opinion. It, oh, yeah. It's precisely the reason why I believe regulation is superior to merger review in this industry compared to, say, pharma. I wanted to say something about the, the supposed tension between antitrust and consumer protection. I think, first of all, we have lots of empirical evidence that this is false. We gave our data to monopolists and look what happened, okay? Russians, et cetera. So I think that is one point. Uh, theoretically, we know that this is false. Privacy is an element of quality. And if I set up the rules of the road properly, then I went competition generates higher quality for consumers. And if privacy is an element of quality, we get more of that. So I think that we're allowing, by asking this question, we're allowing ourselves to contemplate a false dichotomy. And particularly it's false if we think we're any good as economists. Can't we derive, devise a privacy law that sets up property rights? And then can't the theorists figure out a way to use open standards, incentives, and some mechanism to bring these into alignment? I mean, that, that seems to me to be exactly the challenge of the decade for economists to make uh, competition give us more of all the things we want as consumers, including privacy. And we just don't have an environment that delivers that to us right now. But I, I think the idea that these are opposed is a complete setup and that as economists, we should reject it and say, no, we can, we can create an environment where these are aligned, aligned in a way that helps consumer welfare. In with competition and privacy, so there is um, a phenomenally good paper by Darren Asimoglu with co-authors that he wrote last fall, where he's basically saying um, it's about the usage of data. So what's important when it comes to the Google and the Facebook is not just your personal history, but they put together, this company, some data uh, about yourself with some other data of people like you. Okay, so sometimes it's your time history, sometimes it's the websites you, you go through, and sometimes it's people like you. Okay, they don't really know about you, they need to know that you are an Italian male living in North London or something. Like that. That's enough, you know. So, when I give out my data and I may be personally uh, totally informed about the choice I'm making, um, I'm also giving out data about someone else like me that may have totally different privacy preferences. So there is a negative externality. That's what the paper of Asimoglu et al. is about. So the analogy, the analogy, if you think, is maybe it's, a, it's an extreme example, as in my, all my examples, is like with cigarettes. Okay? So cigarettes, is, there's two types of, of problems. One is information at the individual level. Do you really know the cigarettes are bad for your health? Or similarly, do you really know how your data is gonna be used? And that's GDPR, that's exante regulation. Okay? That's exante regulation, making sure there can be informed consent. I don't think we are there. I don't think we are there. I don't think we are able to understand the implications of us given our data. And maybe three years from now, this data is gonna be used by some credit rating company and they saw some of my web. So, so I don't think we are really able to make informed choices, but that's one thing. I inform you about your choices, and then in this libertarian attitude, you decide individually whether you want to give your data or not. You, you go for the free app, or you go for the paid app, where you, 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 you give less data. So this would solve the, the individual problem, but that's not enough. It's like cigarettes, because you may be smoking in a public space. So even if you internalize everything on your health, you don't inter inter internalize the effect you have on others. And this is important when it comes to data. Data are collected statistically, and so you will still, even if you give out, you know, if, if you have an informed decision because you understand the consequences through a, a, a well-defined GDPR, then the, the, the externality remains. And when externalities remain, 
we need to, re to, to, to regulate them like we do in uh, cigarettes with prices for it, for it, for it with uh, uh, taxes. And that's an example. So it's not enough just to inform people. It's an important aspect, but to say that the, the problem is really um, one of some fundamental externalities which exist in targeted advertising uses statistical information, in which is the characteristic of this market. So you, so if I get you both correctly, so you would think that also there, uh, a, say, a smart regulation would be uh, the right way to solve the problem, and that actually there is no real tension between uh, competition policy or merger policy and uh, and data protection. We are, we are, we are both <laughs> saying. That. I think the business models of some of these companies, some of these companies, the business model is based on data collection. So if we keep a silos approach using consumer protection on the one hand, and then we have competition on the other hand, we are missing the point. I mean, they cannot be two, 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 two separate, up. it's the same thing. So you will never get to understand the business model. Google Fitbit, if you don't think through the implication this might have on data a, a collection, and if you do just data, you know, the usual market definition, this is a wearable, there is something which is, there is competition, and I don't see through the, the data implication and, and, and the privacy impl implication, it's very likely you're going to miss big time what the, the deal is about. I mean, okay. uh, again, uh, as opposed to repeating some of the things that I would say, uh, there, we have externalities in here. We need the transparency. I think that's something that Fiona also mentioned, that uh, competition is going to help, but it will require transparency. Uh, People need to know what is it that's going on. But once we have that, these are problems that we've had in the past in other markets. We know about externalities. We've regulated other markets where there are externalities. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything that's fundamentally different in here with that respect. Uh, and there are industries where we have externalities where we know competition helps. So I, I, um, they're not, I think they're kind of orthogonal in some ways. I don't think they're opposed or in favor. They're largely orthogonal issues. Well, but if you don't incorporate the externality into the competition regime, as Tommaso is saying, then you don't get competition on the dimensions consumers yeah, want. Agreed. You get the, the problems hidden and then the, you know, the, the products look the same and they're not. And, and if the loaf of bread with poison in it and the loaf of bread without look the same, and that's why we have regulation on food purity so that, you know, competition occurs on a dimension consumers mm -hmm. care. Yeah. So there, there was, uh, so I, I get some information from the organizer. So that still, so the chat can be only see uh, if everybody's writing, not only to the panelists, but also to the attendees. And there was uh, one question uh, that we uh, already answered, but so for the audience, it was about, so uh, a question by um, uh, Simonetta Vezzoso, uh, why aren't there more downrights? Uh, could they help? Right, so um, so somehow from the discussion that we had before, it seems that you think it should be possible uh, for the antitrust authorities to go there and, and ask us access to the data to, to understand uh, better the, the market. Or uh, as you mentioned in, in this vo in Vox uh, uh, paper, so when you look at the documents, private documents and emails, and I can confirm it. Uh, it was the same for us when we did this work for the CMA. When you look at the documents by the companies, uh, you have a bit of a different view of what is actually going on. So do you think down rates uh, could be a good uh, instrument, good tool to improve uh, merger policy? So don't. So I'm not a legal expert. Don't raids in Europe, I think, can be used only if you think there is a cartel. Uh, don't raids in mergers, I never heard. But in a merger, European authorities have all the power to ask for every document they want. Of course, the lawyer will say no. It's uh, the request is uh, is uh, is uh, is too tough, and they will come. But but you can. Basically, you can. The question is that I have rarely observed a will. A real will to engage with the digital platform because regulators are uncertain. So the case in point would be Facebook, WhatsApp. Documents existed, existed, and we, but they came to our attention. They were probably already in the hands of the commission back then. I hadn't joined, but then they came to our attention when there was a parliamentary inquiry in the UK, okay, and there was a leakage of that information, and some journalists went through because they are, you know, 
thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of emails, and they found that, uh, that uh, Facebook had bought a, a company, an Israeli company called Onavo. Onavo was, was probably illegally tracking the usage of uh, the phones you were using and you had installed the Onavo app. And then uh, they would sell the usage of uh, this uh, information to market players, like in this information. And then Facebook bought Onavo for itself and then kept that information for itself. They were tracking exactly the evolution of which app was the most successful in the market. And then they saw that WhatsApp was growing very fast. And there are these emails sent to Mark Zuckerberg. So usually when there is internal communications, typically the lawyers of the, of the company or their, or their advocates would say, but this is a, you know, a communication between an intern who has a no no, no power inside the company whatsoever. But that was instead an email sent to Mark Zuckerberg saying, Mark, this application is really good. They are growing really, really fast. They have already hundreds of millions. And that was not a startup, by the way. So WhatsApp is going, what shall we do? Shall we buy it? And Mark Zuckerberg says, yes, go for it. So this is incredibly valuable information. You can base a case on it if you have the political will to do that and, res and the resources to do that. And so if we go back to the issue of resources, even if I see in the chat that people are su suggesting, why don't they pay, why don't they get, this is really not the current reality. And forces don't have a lot of resources. The chief economist team was made, is made by 30 something PhD economists. That's about it. And these PhD economists have to run all the simultaneous antitrust state data merger cases of Digicom. So, that's the reality. So if you think that in an alternative world, we might have the ability, the money, etc., I don't see that alternative world. So that, that's why I'm strongly in favor of a reversing of the burden of proof, because then, then, then it's feasible from a resource, an institutional resource constraint we currently have. Let me explain to you that counterfactual world. So I'm now Facebook, and I want to buy WhatsApp, and the burden of proof is on me right now. And of course, I'm not going to talk about all those emails. I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, which they're growing. It's a very good product. Oh, oh but the, no, Louise, the, the agency gets to look at the emails. I mean, the adversarial process means that the agency is doing its side also. I, I don't think the activities in preparation for litigation are any different. But when you get to court, it's the agent, it's the, it would be the firms that have to carry the burden of proof. Right? And so also, Louise. Lulus and efficiency has to be merger specific. So I would need to know, sorry, you've got already your messenger app, okay? Why do you need WhatsApp to be better? Why do you need the acquisition to become better? Can you explain? So th this is the type of question so, that would initiate a conversation that would be more fruitful. So uh, Luis had this proposal, you had this proposal to pay the DOJ, so to, to have a tax. So yeah. do you think that that is uh, uh, politically, uh, uh, easier to implement than uh, uh, reversing the burden of proof, which would be the one alternative? Uh, politically easier. Gee, I, I don't know. That probably depends on what uh, political constituency you're talking about, political uh, jurisdiction. I, I, I don't know. I, I do think it makes a lot more sense for an impartial party to initiate an investigation than, uh, than, 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 than the other one. And that's why I, I remain very skeptical about, about this proposal. Now, whether uh, the resource issue would be uh, uh, easier than, than that, uh, I never thought much about that. I don't know. Uh, I think that given the current status of, of the big giants, given the image, which is the reality we have about how uh, a flush with cash they are, uh, it, it wouldn't be very difficult for us, at least selectively for uh, uh, these giants to impose that they would have to pay um, a fraction, a percentage, or a fixed amount, or what have you, if they want to initiate a, a review process. I, 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 so, yep. I don't Senator, see that as being politically very difficult. Senator Klobuchar has uh, proposed a bill that does that. For mega mergers, the filing fee is much bigger uh, than a standard filing fee. But I, I just want to make sure the audience is clear that reversing the burden of proof doesn't mean that the agency doesn't do the work. The agency mm -hmm. does the work because the agency has to figure out whether they want to challenge the merger or not. So they're very interested in doing that work and they have complete access to all the documents in the United States and so forth. What flipping the burden of proof does is when you get to the courtroom, 
the job would be that Facebook WhatsApp would have to show that WhatsApp would not be a competitor in the future. They would have to have, there would be some standard, clear, you know, preponderance, clear and convincing, whatever the legal standard was uh, written in, in this new world, uh, that, that there was not going to be a competition problem from that merger. And I think that's a nice change because the proving it ab is above proving something is above the bar assembling all the witnesses and the documents and everything to get a case above the bar is expensive and the parties have both the financial incentive and the informational advantage to do that if in fact it's true so and and from your experience Tommaso, in europe uh, so the system in europe is different you don't go to court right so uh, how would you see the reverse of the burden of proof uh, in in our system in the, so this is where i personally again my experience is limited to my 3 years mandate so uh, i i hadn't done work before and i'm not doing work in this area i'm i'm not doing any consultancy work so the, it seems there is, so Digicomp is a thousand people, a bit less. Of those half, 500 are doing state aid. Uh, and then uh, the remaining are doing antitrust and mergers. The chief economist team is 30 something. There are some economists scattered around the place. All the phase two mergers, they go through the chief economist team. The chief economist team is basically in charge of doing all the technical analysis. And I have very fond memories of those three years that in, at, at the commission. I really loved it. Fantastic, fantastic colleagues, but they work a lot. They work a lot. So I don't know if it is true, but the Facebook WhatsApp was coming at the summertime. They had just you know, really burned their brains in yet again another mobile merger, uh, a four to three somewhere that involved all the economists, etc. cetera. And, uh, and Facebook WhatsApp was a phase one merger. People didn't have the power because the way Digicomp is organized would be exactly the same directorate who does telecoms and media, et cetera. And the same people in that, a, a director had been working 20 hours a day for the past two or three months to do this phase two merger that was very complicated. So the resource issue is enormous in my view, enormous. And so if, uh, of course, you, we can change it. We can give more money to Digicomp. I don't think it, it is coming with nationalism. I don't see individual member states contributing more. I live in a country which actually has got itself out of the EU. So there's going to be even less money attributed to the European institution. So, so it is bad. So I do care a lot about that type of work. And I think it would actually stress people less and it would concentrate on the real issues. I would see probably better economic submissions because I would expect that these smart guys to have very smart economists, but at least we could, we could go through, we could go through, we could, we could go through those submissions instead of having this war of attrition where we have to spend hours and hours and days and days saying that this market is subject to free entry. And we, we, we always live in a world of Bertrand competition with no barriers to entry. Half of, of the time of the chief economics team was spent rebutting that in any submission, we are in a world of Bertrand competition with no barriers to entry and infinite capacity. Although prior to the merger, the margins were, were above, uh, you know, above the roof. So, and this is where, you know, it, it's really a money burning exercise. Luis, so, you want to say something on this? Yeah, I mean, we agree that Europe and the US are different. We just realized it here, they, there are some fundamental differences, but they have one thing in common that both Fionn and Tomaza are largely making cases about asymmetry of resources. That we're overwhelmed, we don't have enough people, we don't have enough money, they can hire all sorts of consultants, they this, they that. Uh, I agree, there's an enormous asymmetry of resources. That's why, you know, I, I was not aware of uh, Klobuchar's proposal. You know, let's just explore something like that and let's make it not larger, but humongously larger uh, submission fee for the large firms. And then uh, finally, DOJ finally has some resources to start uh, doing uh, their work. And they can uh, uh, hire the best expert witnesses in court if they feel that uh, it's worthwhile. I will, right. I will say though that the, the interaction with the default does not go away. It's still the case that when you think about rising, if you look at the markups in Jan and Jan's paper, the top 10% of firms markup is where the markups rising the most. 
So when you think about what profits are at stake here, it's humongous enough that I would be surprised if you could get a filing fee that was had the right number of zeros after it. So if that's a company fighting for all those profits and the default is if they can confuse everyone, they get to have the profits, then you're going to spend up to a dollar of those profits in creating confusion. So I'm not sure that money alone is going to do it. Right. An, so, important, uh, an important remark in what Fiona said for the benefit of the audience, especially those which are doing empi important empirical research on markets, we should always draw differences between those studies like Jan and Jan looking at the universe of firms vis-a-vis -vis the firms we are talking about now. So enforcers deal with, with firms really at the top of the concentration distri distribution. So, so let's try some, some try sometimes not to over -gen generalize. Here we're really, really talking about market power where market power probably matters, okay? And instead people sometimes are looking at the whole uh, sample of firms and they are not comparable in my opinion. So it's, if we want to say something about policy and merger policy in that, in that particular, it will be extremely useful if people could zoom on the firms that are of interest to them. Which again, so it's going in the direction of thinking of identifying some firms uh, that are particularly problematic and then maybe deal with these firms uh, differently, right? So, so we only have four minutes. Uh, so, um, so clearly there is uh, something where one would like to go and there is a miserable situation uh, uh, in which we are now, right? So, uh, so it's not always possible to have uh, the best of all worlds. Uh, so, what would you? In one I would minute, like to go for a beer with all of you, if possible. Yeah, yeah that's a good uh, one. So, that's, so what would be the intermediate the intermediate step? So, what would you think should come now? Uh, like to deal with uh, Google, uh, Fitbit, uh, or this kind of merger. So maybe with the many mergers that will come now after the Corona crisis, because Google has so much money and start buying even more than before. I think the thing that we can all do as economists in the immediate medium term is explain how it is that we have a problem or can have a problem from these platforms. Questions like, oh, there couldn't possibly be any harm because the services are free are just like not even worth it. Like if you have a PhD in economics, you should not be asking that question. Sorry, Yossi, but you shouldn't. I mean, there's quality, there's innovation. There's all sorts of stuff we know how to describe. There's quality adjusted prices. I think that if the people who make policy decisions across both Europe and the United States understood this better, then we would have some chance of getting more resources, of getting cases brought when we want them, of getting sensible policy reforms. So um, I agree with Fiona, and I think the uh, most important step is uh, these industries badly need to be regulated. There's virtually no regulation. And a prior step to regulation is Fiona's point. We need to uh, clarify things. We, we need to explain to people why these industries need to be regulated. So I think she gave you step one, I'm giving you step two. I think that uh, that's where the marginal dollar is worth the most in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, government resources being spent on uh, taking care of, of, of these industries. Tomaso? I think that uh, conversations like this one, to the extent that they are shared uh, beyond academia, are going to be extremely informative for policymakers. In my personal experience, I was a bit shocked by the way economics is filtered when it comes to policymakers through think tanks, through lobbyists. And unfortunately, economists, those which are research active, don't engage enough, I think. So it, it would be good if this message is, uh, as a profession, we think there are problems that Euro regulators should, uh, should uh, try to find solutions through resources, through rebuttal, of, I don't know, but, but, but there is a fundamental problem out there that be, which we understand and we're helping you to go through. And this is happening now, so the, the, the momentum is actually fine, it's maybe coming a bit too late, but also academia, unfortunately, for several reasons, for several reasons, some are our, um, mistake as well, but, but we, we haven't engaged enough. So we, we, so what a lawyer, this is really as a, 
I read it somewhere, I don't know where, but it's like, and I, I may misquote it, but I read somewhere that when, when it comes to policy circles, there is this notion of modern antitrust, modernization of antitrust. And somewhere I read that this discussion, which is about the economics, it's about a debate that economists were having 30 years ago about a way economics was used 50 years ago. And this is modernization of antitrust. So basically the Chicago school critique of 30 years ago to the structural presumption from 50 years ago. And this is where in some parts of the legal sector we have remained. And I think luckily IO has progressed immensely, but we didn't make sure that some of these messages were actually went, went, went through. And this is part of my job of, of telling people in academia, do this, this kind of work. And I think, I, I would hope that departments and journals are open to this kind of research questions because they are important, very important. Wonderful. So it was really, really a pleasure. So I think that uh, um, these uh, final remarks make clear uh, that uh, this kind of panels can be very useful. So this will be on YouTube. Uh, so make sure to use uh, uh, all your power to share this to the world. Uh, it's also wonderful to see, I mean, at the beginning, I, I had the impression there is still some controversial debate at the end. Actually, you all agree with uh, Luis saying, I completely agree with uh, Fiona. And on top of that, uh, I think that we should regulate uh, more of this industry. So maybe that is a message. Uh, so indeed, regulation, ex ante regulation of at least some platforms is uh, um, where we should come as soon as possible. And in between is uh, beautiful and wonderful to listen to uh, great economists uh, that are not just uh, sitting in their uh, office doing research, but uh, explaining- We cannot be in our offices. We <laughs> yeah, can't. Or, I am in the office. I came- uh, Oh, right. good for you. So, um, so okay, I, it was a pleasure. Think, yeah, thank you very much, and I really hope to see you soon. And Tommaso, I see something uh, rising. So, do you want to say something? I will say goodbye. Yeah, thank you very much. So now uh, I I believe uh, Christian wants to say a word about so the next seminar. So this is the new uh, community. So Christian. So uh, again, thanks everyone for attending today's panel. I just wanted to announce uh, what's upcoming. Next week's speaker will be Dina Mason at USC. Um, very much looking forward to seeing you on May 21st, same time, same place. And thanks again to the speakers for this very lively and very interesting panel. Thank you. See you next Thank week. You all. Bye bye. Thank you guys. Thank Take you care. Man. I hope be safe. to have a beer okay. soon. Yes. <laughs>